Thank you, Tori. Hey, Tori's heading back to New York City after having been with us for a long time. And if you happen to see her, make sure you give her a socially distant hug. When I was new to my faith, I wanted to share it with one of my friends, Louis. Louis and I went away for a weekend retreat with a bunch of young adults. Uh, we borrowed somebody's house, and it was a pretty wild time, actually. It was kind of a party weekend. And uh, at one moment, Louie and I were standing in a doorway, and somebody came up to us, and she said, you know, there is something about you that is so different. I, I mean, just the kindness, the brightness, the, the laughter, the steadiness. What is it about you? And uh, I thought, oh, this is my moment, you know, to, to share about Jesus with my friend Louie. And just as I'm about to open my mouth to give the answer I've kind of been waiting to give for the longest time, I, I looked at her and I realized, she's not asking me, she's asking Louie. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Louie, you know, the Bible says, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you. But what happens when they're not asking the Christian? They're asking the pagan next door. Oh, they were wanting to know, what, what, what does Louis have? What about his hope? Well, we're studying the book of Philemon together. And why Philemon, you might ask? Well, because Philemon gives us a little window into the early movement of Jesus as it's growing in a pagan world. And it has to do with this motif of family. These are the people who love God and they love their neighbor and they relate to them as though they were family, pulling them in. Last week we talked a little bit about the relationships outside the church, um, how we share faith. Remember the little poem that I taught you? See if you can recall it. Never meet an unbeliever, always be a good receiver, and when you find something to commend, point out the faith inside your friend. This week, I want to talk about the words that we use. What do we say? Let's talk about telling our story. I want to encourage you to pull out a Bible and open up to Philemon chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. And notice how St. Paul speaks to Philemon out of his own Jesus story, his own story. Let's look at Philemon's verses 8 through 10. If you're able and you'd like to stand, it's a great way to honor God uh, who is the subject of this text. Paul writes, and by the way, you're welcome to read aloud as I read, and when we do, I'll say this is the word of the Lord, and you can say, thanks be to God. Listen carefully, you're reading God's holy word. For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I am appealing to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Heaven and earth will pass away, but what we just read never will. If you stood, please be seated. Let's start with this insight. Growing things reproduce life in others. You have a gift to give. Growing things reproduce life in others. You have a gift to give. This is a principle of biology and also spirituality. And it's a principle that's at work in the relationship between Paul and Onesimus. Notice what Paul says in verse 10. I am appealing to you, Philemon, for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become. And you go, what? What? Paul's not a father. He's not even a husband. He's not married, has no kids. What is he talking about here? And by the way, he uses a word that gets translated in the Old English as begat. Uh, like, I begat Onesimus in chains. Well, we see this word in the genealogies of the Bible. We understand it there, like Matthew 1. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob. But here it makes no sense. Paul says, I begat Onesimus. What's he saying? This is more than just fictive kinship language. This is actually the way Jesus spoke about the new life. He said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. It's not a metaphor. It's actually a metaphysical reality. Something changes. When we stand before Jesus Christ and we say yes to him, we are infused suddenly with a spiritual life, the life of God. We become children of God. 
This is what the Bible promises us in John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Jesus says, to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of flesh or of the will of man, but of God. I begat Onesimus. Just think about that for a moment. It reminds me of something that Eve said. You know, Eve was the first person who became a parent. She gave birth to Cain, the first birth ever. And I love her words in, in uh, Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. She says, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. <laughs> it's like, she sounds like a chemist or a Hollywood uh, agent. I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. And you kind of go, really, Eve? Is that all what you've done? Um, the, the reader of Genesis knows this is a God who produces life out of nothing by divine fiat, right? Let there be light, and there was light. No, God is the one who creates Cain. And yet, she's not wrong either, is she? Because God has chosen to create this life inside of her life. And so she's right when she says, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. It's like she's saying, I've had a front row seat to the mystery and to the beauty of the power and the glory of God working in the world. I've actually seen him bring a human being to life right in front of me. And, and Paul's saying something similar, isn't he? He's saying, uh, when I saw Onesimus say yes to Jesus, I had the privilege of having a front row seat to to the beauty and the mystery and the power and the glory of what God is doing right in front of me, not in bringing Onesimus to life physically, but in bringing him to life spiritually, I, I saw him receive eternal life. I begat Onesimus. That's what Paul's saying. It's worth thinking about that and the beauty of that. We should all want to have that same front row seat. God has reproduced the life of Jesus in another person through me, Paul says, with wonder. Reminds me of Dawson Trotman, the founder of Navigators. He tells a story of being in Edinburgh, Scotland, and seeing uh, two couples with their baby carriages passing each other, perambulators or whatever they called them in, in, back in that day. One couple was finely dressed and they had a fancy stroller. The other couple was in rags, and they had looked like a second-hand affair. And yet, as they passed each other, Dawson Trotman thought to himself, how wonderful that God gives life to two people. They fall in love, and then a new life comes out of that love relationship. And he said there's a principle there, and that is that, that living things, in the ordinary course of things, experience love and reproduce. We are born to reproduce. That's the name of his uh, famous sermon. It's worth listening to back in the 1950s. Uh, he says, every person who is born into God's family is to multiply. It's, just, it's a spiritual principle. Like As we experience the love of God and we share that love with other people, out of that we grow into maturity and we reproduce, that God produces new life in Christ in other people through us. Bill Bright used to ask two questions wherever he went. He, he would say, he'd say, first of all, what's the greatest thing that's ever happened to you? And the Christian would say, well, <laughs> the greatest thing that's ever happened to me is coming to know Jesus, the resurrected Jesus as my Savior and Lord. I mean, what could be greater than that? And then Bill Bright would ask, well, here's a second question. What's the greatest thing you could do for another person? And the Christian would say, well, I guess it's to introduce them to Jesus Christ, the living Christ, as their Savior and Lord, right? You were born to reproduce. And so this is what Paul wants Philemon to know. Hey, look, there's a miracle that's happened here. This man, this young man that you think of as a slave, he's a child of God. He, he has crossed the threshold from death to life, eternal life. He's moved from the power of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son, as Paul would write elsewhere. He's come under the lordship of Jesus Christ with grace in his spirit, as Paul says at the end of this little letter, Philemon. He's now 
got eternal spiritual life coursing through his veins. Wow. I have become a spiritual father to a young man, Onesimus. So what I'm saying is growing things reproduce life in others. You have a gift to give. But then if you're like me, the question is like, well, how do I, how do I give a gift like that? I would love to, but how, do I, how would I do that? Well, here's the second principle. The story of growing in Christ is a seed that brings life to others. You have a story to tell. The story of, of, of a life growing in Christ is a seed that brings life to others. You have a story to tell. Have you ever noticed that wherever Paul goes, he tells his Jesus story? I mean, it's almost obnoxious. Like, he's always telling a story. What is it with this guy? Does he love himself? No. He's telling a Jesus story. Not just his story, but a Jesus story. And in fact, he's doing it right now in this letter. You know, Paul writes the letter to Philemon because he wants Philemon to welcome Onesimus back, not as a slave, but as a free man. He wants him to set him free. But even here, Paul can't write this letter without slipping in a little bit of his own biography, his own story. You notice it in verse 9, the second half of it. Paul says, and I, Paul, do this, I write this, as an old man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. As an old man, as a prisoner. Why does he say that? It's not to have leverage over um, Philemon, like I'm older than you uh, or I've suffered more than you and so I get to tell you what to do. No, actually, no. Well, scholars say Paul bends over backwards in this letter not to use any kind of leverage at all. This is not about duty, Paul has said. This is about love. So he's not, he actually withholds what he sometimes claims his apostolic authority. He could order him as an apostle, but he doesn't. So why is he telling these two things, it, it's because he's telling a story, and that's what Paul does. And Paul knows that his story points to Jesus. So we get it here in brief. We, we get it here in what John Dixon calls two gospel bites. And I like that little phrase, gospel bites. It might be helpful to you. <clears throat> By the way, if you are a reader and you like to read a book about how to share your faith, I highly recommend John Dixon's book, The Best Kept Secret of Christian Mission. And by the way, the secret is that it's easier than you think. But he defines a, a, a gospel bite as a, a phrase or two that's brief that piques someone's interest or opens up opportunities for further conversation then or later. It's a little, little sound bite because people don't, they're always ready for a full gospel download. They don't necessarily want that, and there isn't time for that. In most, most cases, life is lived on the fly. You know, you're, um, you, you're at the sideline of a soccer game, or you're on a road trip with somebody, you're on a bus next to someone, or um, you, you, you know, you're, you're just you're at the laundromat. You're just, something's happening. So, so how do you get their attention with your story? How do you share your story? Well, you'd use a gospel bite, just a little piece of it. And we get two of those here. Um, old man, Paul says. That's a gospel bite. And prisoner of Christ Jesus. That's another one. And, and they, behind each of those phrases, there's a whole story, right? If you just think about it, it almost brings tears to my eyes to read this. Now I write as an old man. As I get older and I think, of, there's a story there of Paul's life. It says, also I write as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And there's a story there behind that phrase of Paul's ministry. He doesn't have to tell the whole story right now. Right? Actually, because Philemon knows the story. In fact, you know why Philemon knows the story? We find out when we get to verse 19. The reason is because Paul's his spiritual father as well. Uh, Paul has shared his story already with Philemon. And that's how Philemon came to spiritual life. Through Paul's story. So Philemon doesn't need the whole story, just the sound bites that kind of remind him of Jesus. And so, because of that, Philemon, when he hears these two sound bites, can easily imagine what it was like for Onesimus to come to faith in Jesus. Let me try to describe that. Here's how I would reconstruct the scene. I don't know if this is true, but let's just remember Paul is under house arrest in Rome, probably in a small house or apartment. He's in chains, he says that. And somehow, 
Onesimus shows up. I don't even know if you need an appointment or whatever to get time with Paul while he's under house arrest, but Onesimus shows up. And so here's what happens. Paul goes, in my imagination, so Onesimus, tell me your story, which, by the way, is a great question. So tell me your story. And Onesimus says, well, you know, I, I'm, I come from Colossae, and I lived in a house with a guy named Philemon, and he held me as a slave. And we, we kind of had a hard time together. We had a conflict, and I said, I'm out of here. I escaped. And I came a thousand miles to Rome. It's a better place to live if you're on the lamb and kind of blend in with the crowd. And so here I am. Now, I heard that uh, you were here, Paul. And I remember that my master, Philemon, had a relationship with you or friends. And so I thought, as I was thinking about maybe you could help me bring some resolution to this situation. And Paul listens and he listens and he's like taking it in. He's listening for faith, like we said last week. And uh, at some point, Onesimus, feeling like Paul really cares for him, says, hey, Paul, would you tell me your story? I'd love to hear your story. And Paul's been waiting for that. And he goes, okay, yeah, I loved it. But, you know, um, Onesimus, when I tell you my story, would you mind if I use a little God talk? Which is a great thing to say. you mind if I use a little bit of God talk here? Because uh, I can't really tell my story without the God talk. And so Philemon would go, sure, that doesn't bother me at all. Go for it. And then Paul would tell him about how he grew up in a place called Tarsus, this Jewish boy, and he became a rabbi, was good in school, became a a Pharisee. Actually, he started persecuting these people who started to claim that Jesus had risen from the dead. (laughs) Until one day, he was on a business trip to Damascus, and he meets this Jesus himself, risen from the dead. And it just turns his whole world around. To the point, he goes, I received a gift from Jesus it's so great, it like swallows up my weakness, all of my weaknesses. And it's so great, it actually makes all of my accomplishments seem like nothing. And Philemon's going, whoa, never heard it quite like that before. And he would say, I want this gift myself. Can you tell me how to know Jesus? And that's how he says yes and becomes a believer. And that's how Paul becomes a spiritual father, by sharing his story. Now, this is what Paul does wherever he goes. He tells us Jesus' story. He tells it in a synagogue. He tells it in jail. He tells it to businesswomen like Lydia. He tells it to intellectuals like the folks in Athens. He tells it to sailors at sea. He tells it to kings like Agrippa. Sometimes they tell him, Paul, you're just a fool. This is crazy talk. Sometimes Jesus surprises everybody, and they belief. And he becomes a father again through his story. You have a story to tell. You have a story to tell. I want you to understand that. Fun fact, Martin Luther, you know, the guy that translated the Bible from the Greek language into the New Testament from the Greek into German for the first time in 1522. Martin Luther When he looked at the Greek New Testament, he found 30 different word groups for communication. But when he translated it, he translated those 30 different words into only two German words, essentially preach and proclaim, preach and proclaim. Now, unfortunately, he chose two words that were almost exclusively associated with clergy at that time in Germany. By the way, the King James Version They took those 30 words and reduced them to 15 words, but similar thing. Here's the message. If you're not clergy, you're not qualified to talk about your faith. Do you believe that? No, I don't believe that. We don't believe that here at UPC. You have a story to tell. You know, the problem that I had with my friend Louis I say that he was a pagan, but I was, I'm, I was as a pagan as he was. I mean, our lives were just the same externally. The only difference was that I knew I was beloved of God, and I didn't know what uh, Louis knew. But we were right there living the same basic lifestyle. And, and the thing was, actually, I didn't know that he needed a story. I didn't understand that. I thought the way it was supposed to work is, it would be enough for me just to be a nice person and to be near Louis. Right? I sort of thought the way it works is I'm a person of faith, and if I'm nice, if I'm like the nicest person Louis knows, he eventually asks, hey, what is it that makes you so nice? You know, 
Um, he starts to copy my life to be like me. If, but I realize if, 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 if the way this works is he has to copy my niceness, I would never make a Christian. I would only make a legalist. A legalist is someone who tries to come before God by their own good works. Uh, he, he would see a person who does good works, and he would try to be like a person who does good works. He tried to do good works himself. I mean, without a story, that's what he would assume. And he would miss grace. He would miss the great story. I mean, the, the, the great story is, is not implied, it's proclaimed. You know, I didn't know. I had a story to tell uh, about a God who rescues a world that, that can't do anything for itself, about a God who, 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 who s- sends himself into the world as one of its creatures, that, about a God who dies for the ungodly, as we learned last week, about a Savior who rises from the dead, who rules over all, who's coming again to make all things new. I mean, this is the great story. You don't just get it by osmosis. He needed a story. And actually, I didn't know that I had a story. I didn't know I had a story to tell. I mean, I'd never had a bright flash of light, never heard an audible voice, uh, was never in a motorcycle gang, never dealt drugs, um, never had a turnaround story in any dramatic way. I thought, I don't even have a story to tell. I'm just a middle-class kid in suburban America who fell in with some Christians and started reading the Bible, right? But you know what I realized? That is a story. Even that is a story, and that's my story. As I think about my story of Jesus, I have a Jesus story. Jesus carried me through five surgeries, surgeries that blew up a rowing career. Jesus healed me from the soul sickness that drove me through the party scene from one empty party to another. Jesus led me from a law firm to an inner city, from political ambition to service and ministry. Jesus brought grace and restoration to my family life. Jesus confronts my pride. He exposes and forgives my sin. Jesus gives me strength and weakness. That's my story. I do have a Jesus story. And so do you. I just gave you my story in a few gospel bites, and I wonder what your story would sound like in gospel bites. Will you say, oh, George, my story is so boring. (laughs) You know, I was raised by Christian parents, and I've never not been a believer. I'll tell you, that's a strange story for me. That's not a story I know about. I'd love to hear that story. The problem is so many of us don't tell our stories because we have preconceived notions about what our stories are should be like. Your story is not powerful because it's like other people's story. Your story is powerful because it's unique, because it's your story, because it's authentic. I think the world is really hungry right now for authentic, credible stories of Jesus, and you've got one. I've heard all kinds of stories. I've heard stories of people who came to faith because they There was a plane crash, people who came to faith because they stepped on a piece of bubble gum and then a gospel track that stuck to their shoe. I've heard of people who came to faith in prison, people who came to faith in Sunday school, people who came to faith from their spouse or through a divorce, people who came to faith through reading a book or through having a dream. There are all kinds of different stories, right? Paul's got a story, Mary Magdalene's got a story, Elizabeth's got a story, Peter's got a story, Priscilla, Timothy, Phoebe, John, Mark, Barnabas, they've all got stories and they're all different, they're all unique to them. But what they all have in common is Jesus. and He's the one that makes it powerful. So I want to encourage you to do the work of spiritual autobiography. Spiritual autobiography. The work of spiritual autobiography is putting your Jesus story into your own words. It's a spiritual discipline that is invented by Paul. We see it in the New Testament. <clears throat> It was perfected in North Africa by a man named Augustine in the fourth century. Augustine wrote a memoir of his life, and he called it The Confessions, which I recommend reading. And one translator at the beginnings of The Confessions says this, Augustine undertakes to plumb the depths of his memory, to trace the mysterious pilgrimage of grace which his life has been. I love that. What would happen if you plumbed the depths of your memory? to trace the mysterious pilgrimage of grace which your life is becoming. That's the work of spiritual autobiography. Finding your own words. 
for your own experience of grace. Gordon T. Smith says, those of us who are beholden to the revivalist tradition sometimes revert to stock phrases that are sort of pre-approved, right? Pre-packaged, received Christ. I trusted Jesus. I got saved. And that language is not wrong. It's just not helpful unless it's your language, right? If it keeps us from plumbing the depths of our own memories. So, so think about your own story and find your own words. When did you become aware you were living in God's grace? When did you discover you were a beloved child of God? Where is the saving work of Jesus redirected and renewed your life? This week, I want to invite you to work that out. I don't know how you do it. Journal. You, maybe you write something. Maybe tell a friend. Maybe you do that in your small group with one another. <clears throat> this would be a good reason to join one of our four-week next-door groups. You guys can work on your spiritual autobiographies together. And I thought Tori gave us a great example today. What I'm saying is the story of growing in Christ is a seed that brings life to others. You have a story to tell. All right, you, you have a gift to give. You have a story to tell. That's what I'm trying to share with you today. Let me close with a picture and two invitations. The, the, first of all, the picture is Paul. Imagine Paul in prayer. This little house in, in Rome, in chains. He's on his knees and he's praying. We, we know this because Paul sends two letters with Onesimus back to Colossae. One we call the letter Philemon. The other we call the letter to the Colossians. And in chapter 4, verse 3, Paul says, I'm praying and I want you to pray that God will open to us a door for the word. Now, it's not that surprising to hear a prisoner praying for an open door, right? Open up the cell, let me out. But he's not praying for a door to open for him to get out. He's praying for a door to open for the word, which is the logos, for the story of Jesus to get out. Pray for an open door. See, that's, that's the picture. Now, here are two invitations. Number one, I want you to pray for the, for the word, for the story of Jesus in your own life. Engage the great story in your story and pray to Jesus that he would do that. In other words, open the door of your heart. The word, this word logos, is the word John uses at the beginning of his God. The word became flesh and blood and dwelt among us, moved into the neighborhood. He's talking about the living God, the resurrected Jesus Christ. Have an encounter with the living God. That's where our mission at UPC begins. And it's essential. All of us have to come to our knees before this Savior's Lord, Jesus Christ. Engage with him to let him engage with us. <laughs> this is not comfortable. We will not remain unchanged if we do this. This is where our mission begins with Jesus. Remember, here's our mission statement. We're a family of communities joining Jesus to transform our lives. This will engage us in a process of spiritual birth and a process of growth and spiritual maturity, transformation, and even reproduction. Maybe somebody's being born right now. Maybe you're hearing me talk about this Jesus and his grace, and you're saying, I want my own Jesus story. I, I've heard others, but I want my own, a real, credible, authentic story of Jesus. If that's you, please take a moment right now and come to upc.org slash Jesus and click on the Pray With Someone button. We have someone, a friendly person right now, who would be so happy to be able to talk with you and pray with you. And you could know you're, you have the gift of spiritual life in you for eternity today. Here's my second invitation. First is to pray the word for the word in your own life. The second is to pray for the word in your neighbor's life through your story. Pray for an open door to carry your story out into the neighborhood. Remember, this is one of our five values. We are sent for others. And our mission, and here's the full mission statement, we are a family of communities joining Jesus to transform our lives and the lives of our neighbors at the University of Washington in our neighborhoods and all around the world. I can tell you, there's nothing that will grow your faith faster than seeing Jesus work through you in the life of another person, through your story. We should all want to experience that mystery that Eve and that Paul experienced. So just imagine becoming a spiritual mother to somebody else or a spiritual father for somebody else. This is what we're praying for you, for each of us. Next door. 
So again, I want to encourage you to join one of our four-week Nextdoor groups at, at upc.org slash Nextdoor. You can get more information. Four weeks. Come on. How bad can it be? But how great could it be if Jesus does a new work in you and through you in your neighborhood? Oh, friends, let's work on our stories. Let's open the door and let's go next door. There's a great story in your story. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you have opened the heart of God. You have become flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Thank you for the beauty and the mystery of what you've done to take sinners and turn us into beloved children of God with you and for you for all of eternity. We ask your blessing on us. Lord, send forth your Holy Spirit in a fresh way today on your church at UPC and your church everywhere that we might move out into the world just as you were sent, Jesus, to serve, to bless, and to tell the good news of a story of a God who brings redemption and renewal to all. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.